three more lectures. Maybe we'll do one, two, three. This up to you because I can explain many, many things. Right. But at least this lecture, I would like to finish the part of the theoretical calculation for the spectral density of uh, um, random uh, Rennie graphs to get the Savel point equation for this density of the deltas. And then I'm going to show you a trick of how to solve this thing numerically by a, 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 an algorithm is called population dynamics. Okay? So the main goal today um, would be the RS uh, derivation uh, to obtain this uh, an equation for, it, for this W of delta. And then how to uh, and then introduce the, the idea of uh, something that's called population dynamics. That is a technique that appears in spin glasses to solve, uh, you know, self-consistent equations of uh, diluted spin glasses in uh, replica symmetric uh, answers or replica symmetric breaking, etc., etc. Right. So. Where were we? We were, again, <laughs> uh, calculating what? So we have the spectral density, uh, rho sub c of lambda, average over this order, and we saw that this was equal to what? No? Minus 2 divided by pi divided by m, uh, the imaginary part of the relative with respect to set of the limit of n going to 0 of 1 over n, the logarithm of the partition function and replicas average over the disorder. And set is equal to lambda minus i eta, right? And here somewhere I have to have this limit. Here I have the limit of eta going to 0 plus. Yeah? And after a tedious derivation, we saw, well, remember, this C is a connectivity matrices or the ensemble of connectivity or adjacency matrices related to for Erdos Renyi graph. Uh, and the matrices are symmetric. CIA is equal to CGI. They take for all I different than J. Then for simplicity, we we'll take the diagonal elements of the matrix equal to zero. And remember that the, it, they take values zero, one. And the probability rule is the probability for two nodes IJ being connected. That means the probability of CIA equal to one is equal to d divided by n, where d is the average connectivity. <clears throat> right. So after a not difficult but tedious calculation, we arrive at the following. Note that the average over the partition function Average over the nth power of the partition function, this could be written as a path integral dp dp hat of the exponential of exponential of n a functional of these two functions where s sub n of p p hat was equal to I times the integral dx sub bar p hat uh, of x bar p of x bar plus d divided by 2 integral over dx dy p x p y times the exponential of the scalar product of x and y minus 1 um, plus the logarithm of the integral over the respect to x 
of the exponential of minus z divided by 2 x squared minus i p hat x. Where in this notation we have that x with the bar below is a vector x1 to xn, x alpha belonging to r. Yeah? And you'll remember what was the goal of all these tricks we, we did. The goal is to arrive to a situation like this, because this is very, very cool, right? That means that if I am interested in the typical properties of very large matrices, or what uh, in physics we call the thermodynamic limit, this integral, when n becomes very large, goes like the exponential of n, and then this function <coughs> is evaluated at p0, p0 hat. Right? Where p0 and p0 hat obey the cell point equations, yeah? Well, and then we end up in what? We end up in saying or uh, putting that at the saddle point, or for n, when n is uh, very large, the average of the empirical spectral density can be written as follows, right? Can be written as uh, the imaginary part of the limit, n going to 0, 1 divided by n, of the integral, this guy here, right? One divided by n. With the limit going to zero, with the limit of eta going to zero plus, that I'm not going to write it anymore, yeah? And I use this formula to go to the second step of the replica method to explain uh, how to make the analytical continuation of the interest to the reals. And then I said, okay, so now this would be a step two of the replica method that I need an answer for this guy. And the answer was that P0 of X in replica symmetric answers can be written as an integral over a parameter, complex parameter, real and imaginary part of some kind of density regarding this parameter of the product for alpha from one to n of the exponential of minus X alpha squared divided by 2 delta divided by the square root of 2 pi delta. Yeah? We were like there, there, right? And then I said, well, and then I argue why this thing should be consistent with the, this idea of replica symmetric ansatz, and then I said, if you plug this thing into here, yeah, then you obtain that the average of the empirical spectral density was equal to the imaginary part of the integral over delta omega delta delta. Yeah. And we left it there, yes? So far so good, as a reminder. So what, it, what remained, that actually wrote down the questions about we in the lab is what on earth how or how on earth I determine this object here? And the way to determine is to, to remember that this uh, order parameter function obeys a side point equation, and the idea is to transform that side point equation into an equation for this omega of delta. And this, from all the directions we have done, maybe this is the most difficult one. But again, it's not difficult, it's, it's annoying. Okay, so let me show you the trick. Or let's do together the derivation to obtain a consistent C or a close equation for this omega of delta. And once we get that to that equation, I'll show you how to solve it numerically by population dynamics. Okay? Very good. So, uh, so okay, let me write down again the two side point equations that we have. So one side point equation was that minus i p not zero x must be equal to what? To d, the integral with respect to y, p zero y exponential of the scalar product of x y minus one or something. This is correct. Yes, 
And the second one is that P0x is equal to exponential of minus z divided by 2 x squared minus i p0 hat x divided by the integral with respect to y of what I have in the numerator. And then the idea is to use the replica symmetric ansatz to get, to transform this couple of equations into an equation of for, again, this object here. So notice that I can combine the two equations so I can get rid of p hat by just simply plugging here p hat. Okay, so let me do that. And what you get is the following. So I get that p0x is equal to exponential of minus z divided by 2 x vector square plus d the integral with respect to y p0 y exponential of the scalar product of x and y minus 1 and for the time being let me put the denominator as the denominator Let me put here simply the denominator. And then I have to plug the RS ansatz into this expression here and here. And I have to try to convert this equation to an equation again for this omega of delta. Is it clear what we have to do? Is it clear? Well, so what is the trick? Because if you look at this expression, it's, it's, very, uh, uh, it's very threatening somehow, no? It's like, uh, it, it's just scaring you. Why? Because if I look on the right-hand side, sorry, left-hand side, I have that this is a convolution of Gaussians, right? So forget if you want out this piece, so see, this is simply a product of Gaussians. Yeah? So here I have an exponential of Gaussian for this variable. But this variable x is here as a as a free variable in this part, which is Gaussian, but this, uh, this x is inside an exponential, inside an exponential. So in order to have to equate uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, I, sh I must be able to somehow take out this uh, x into the first exponential. That's the trick. And the way to do this is to simply do a Taylor expansion of this exponential, of the exponential of the exponential. Okay, so let us do that. So let me take the, and the, for the moment I'm going to ignore the denominator. Let, me, let us focus on the, on the numerator. Yeah. So what I have, let me put the denominator. Numerator there. This part here. This will be our numerator. This is equal to what? This is equal to the exponential of a minus z divided by 2 x vector squared. And then I have the exponential of minus d that I, I take outside, exponential of minus d. And then I have, uh, you see again, exponential of this other term. Okay, so I'm going to do a little expansion of this exponential. So this would be equal to what? would be equal to the series from k from 0 to infinity of 1 divided by k factorial. And then I have, let's do it step by step, d, the integral over y, p0 rs y, the exponential of x scalar product with y to the power k. It's clear what I've done. I've simply done a Taylor expansion of, this, of the exponential with the argument being all this weird thing. Yeah? Clear? Yeah. Sorry? Exponential what? 
I, I don't hear you. Sorry, you have to speak up, man. Is e to the minus d because here there is d with a minus. You want a half is you see I have this piece, and this is normalized, yeah, because this is a, this is a, a distribution. So I have here a minus d that I take out, yeah. So I have the exponential of minus d and then the exponential of this piece and the exponential of this piece. I do a Taylor expansion. Better? Yeah. More questions? Good, so then the other thing I have to do now is to rewrite this thing, right? So let us do that. So then I have that this is the exponential of minus c divided by 2, x vector square. And then I write this thing as follows. Uh, sum for k from 0 to infinity of exponential of minus d, d to the k divided by k factorial. And then these are the same, uh, it's the same, the same integral k times, right? So what I do is I put an extra index to label those integrals, and the only thing that remains equal in all these integrals is the value of x, okay? But because the integration variable is y. So this, I'll write it as follows. I'll write it as the integral for the product for L from 1 to k, dy uh, L, p0, rs, y, uh, L, you want, we can do this thing piece by piece. Product L from zero, from one to k, sorry, P zero R S Y L, and then I have here the exponential of x scalar product with the sum for L from one to k Y L. Zero. The derivatives? What do you mean? Yeah. Okay. So what I have is a. So what I do is a. I have an exponential of something. I write. I, I use the Taylor expansion of R on a equals zero, a, being this. Yeah. Good. More questions? Now, what I do is to put the RS ansatz here. So remember, let me delete here. <clears throat> remember that the RS ansatz for P naught is the integral over the delta omega delta the, opala, the product of alpha from 1 to n of the exponential of minus x alpha squared divided by 2 delta divided by the square root of 2 pi delta. Right, so I plug this thing into here. And then I have to be a bit careful with, the, with having the integrals and new integrals. I have to label them appropriately, etc., etc. All right, so now I will have here k extra integrals, so this would be the following. I have here the exponential of minus z divided by 2, x squared, the sum, k from 0 to infinity, exponential of minus d, d to the k, divided by k factorial. And then I have the following. I have the integral for the product of k l from 1 to k, d delta l, omega delta L, right? This comes from this part here. And then I have the following. I have the product of alpha from 1 to n of what? Of the from 1 to L. Uh, give me a second. Okay, I'll have the product of k of L from 1 to k, the product of alpha. Oh, this part is difficult. Okay, so let us do it step by step better. Okay. And I'll have. 
have here the product of fell from 1 to k dy l and then I have here the uh, product of alpha from 1 uh, to n the product of um, k of l from 1 to k of the exponential of minus y uh, square alpha l divided by 2 delta l divided by a square root of 2 pi delta l right and then I have this guy over here exponential of the scalar product x the sum l from 1 to k of y vector l Let me see this thing from a distance. Uh, very good. That makes sense, right? And again, so the idea is I have to rewrite this thing in such a way that I will have a Gaussian measure for x. So after doing the integral over y, you know, what remains has to be x to the, to the square with something, multiplied by something. There is one parenthesis, this one here. This one here. Yeah? What? Yeah? Very good. So now, replica indexes, where do they appear? They appear, or replicas, they appear here as a product. Here, they are hidden here, no? Also as a product that I can put explicitly, and here in the scalar product, okay? And they also appear here as well. So I do the following now. I say this is equal to something, is equal to the sum of L, or K, sorry from zero to infinity of the exponential of minus d, d to the k divided by k factorial, the multiple integral for l from one to k of the product of d delta l omega delta l. And now I do the following, times the product of alpha from one to n, of what? The first, pair that the first part that has the replica index alpha with x is this one here. Okay? So I have then the exponential of minus z divided by 2 x alpha squared. Let's put this in here. And then I have the integrals over the y's, no? Here I have now the integral I have, sorry, the product with respect to the L from 1 to K of the integral of dy uh, alpha L, the exponential of minus y square alpha L divided by 2 delta L divided by the square root of 2 pi delta L, and then I have this factor here, no? which I can put here, plus X alpha Y uh, alpha L. So again, the trick here is to put things in the right order. You'll see why I'm doing this, okay? You'll see just in the, in the following step. Clear so far? Now, this integral, everybody should be able to do because it's a Gaussian integral, right? So this gives us the following, the sum of k from zero to infinity of exponential of minus d, d to the k divided by k factorial, the integral, multiple integral for the deltas, d delta L omega delta L, and then I have here the following, 
the product alpha from 1 to n, I'll have the exponential of minus z divided by 2, x alpha squared. And this integral will give, this, will give what? Well, it would be simply uh, x alpha squared multiplied by delta L, and then the sum of L from 1 to get. Yeah? With the 1 half. I have plus 1 half the sum over L from 1 to K of uh, delta L, and this multiplies X alpha squared. Yeah? And if you want, I can put this thing together. Y alpha L that comes from this scalar product. So this is the, this is the Howard Stratton transformation, or simply the typical Gaussian integral. So let me put this thing in a compact way. What a half is what a half one half a one half or alpha a square half of z minus the sum of L from one to k of delta. L. Right, and that's the end of the numerator in the derivation. So far, so good. I have not done anything fancy, just annoying. Yeah. Now notice the following. So I want this thing. Now let, let, let's remember that I have the Salpon equations, and this is the right-hand side of the Salpon equations. It's actually the numerator. This must be equal or proportional to p zero r s at x, and this, remember, that is equal to what? To the integral with respect to delta, omega delta, the product alpha from, from 1 to n of the exponential of minus x alpha squared divided by 2 delta, divided by square root of 2 pi delta. Yeah? Again, this must be proportional, okay? Because for the moment, I'm forgetting about the denominator. Clear? So I have to convince somehow. So now I have to find a way to rewrite this guy yeah, in this way. So I can identify with an equation this omega that appears here with this bunch of omegas that appear here. Again, so what I have to do is to rewrite this part, this, uh, this result in such a way that resembles this one so I can identify left hand side with right right hand side so how can i do this thing with the beautiful magic of dirac deltas so the idea is the following yeah you mean taylor expansion Sure. I, I understand the confusion. So I have, okay, I have an equation, what is called a Salpin equation for, for P0 of X. So this is a function of, I can write just one equation. I have a, an equation for this function, yeah? And then based on an observation related to replicas or the symmetry of replicas, I say, okay, this object has to have a certain form. And this form depends, depends on something that is, uh, still needs to be determined, which is this omega of delta. So what I'm trying to do is to rewrite this equation into an equation for omega of delta. Because this part is still undetermined. The only thing I did when I imposed replica symmetric answers is some form for this, but there is an unknown function still too that has to obey the the Salpon equation. Better? Yeah. yeah. The rest is just uh, massaging the, the expression. Yeah? More questions? Okay, so let us use the magic of the Dirac delta. 
in the flow moment. So I continue in this here, and I write. So this is equal, I introduce an integral, to an integral over delta of uh, Okay, let's do it maybe a step by step. First, so this is equal to uh, the sum of k from zero to infinity exponential of minus d, d to the k, divided by k factorial of this multiple integral for the omegas, product of L from one to k, d delta L omega delta L, and then I'm going to do it here. I introduce an integral over a delta, over a variable I introduce, of the uh, product of alpha from 1 to n of exponential of minus x alpha squared divided by 2 delta, divided by the square root of 2 delta of a Dirac delta delta minus 1 divided by z minus the sum for L from 1 to k of delta L. And I, there is a, I have a term missing, but I, I, will, I will put the term. Okay, what, what on earth am, am I doing? Okay, I'm doing nothing in the sense that, that if I were to integrate over delta, you know, this delta is substituted here, and I, I obtain back this expression, right? I'm not doing anything. However, yes, I, I'm actually doing something, because I'm isolating the right pieces to go to the place I want to go, okay? So still this expression is not correct. It's not exactly that expression over there, because here I have a normalization factor that it doesn't appear here. So I have to multiply by a square root of 2 pi delta to the power n, okay? Another expression is inequality. But remember, since we are doing the replica limit when n goes to 0, this term will not be important for this limit. But in other cases, it is important. Very good. Now, what I can do is to say, okay, I can take this integral at the beginning, I can put things in a different order, and then I can identify, I can identify with the left-hand side. So I can write this thing as follows. I do first the integral over this delta, and then I do that this is equal to the sum, k okay, from zero to infinity, exponential of minus delta, delta to the k divided by k factorial of the multiple integral containing the product for L from 1 to K, D delta L, omega delta L. I put this thing here. Dirac delta of delta minus 1 divided by Z minus the sum of L from 1 to K, D delta. I close the bracket. If you want, let me see, I can put this factor here in front. And then I have the product of, well actually let me put it like this. Mm, no, like this one. The product of alpha from one to n of the exponential of minus x alpha squared divided by two delta divided by the square root of two pi delta. You see what I've done? I simply rearrange the terms. Yeah? And the differential of lambda? The differential of what? Of delta. Here. Ah. I, put it, I, 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 I put it in the first place. Why? Why I'm doing this? Because on the left-hand side of the Salmon equation, the, the, the order parameter in RS has this form. Right? So now I know that this, that comes from the, the, the derivation of my numerator, must be equal or proportional to this. Yeah? So what I have here, I have, oh, I see. So I have this term here. 
which is, uh, well, sorry, it's not true. So I have the differential of delta, this one here, which is this one here, no? Then I have the product for these Gaussian functions, which are this one here. And left hand side must be equal to the right hand side because they must obey the style point equation. So that means now you can proceed as you wish. You put this thing onto the other side, equated to zero. You have an integral equated to zero. Must, this means that the integral must be zero. So therefore, this yeah, must be, well, I'm going to use the word equal, okay? It must be equal to precisely this part times this, okay? Now, it's not equal because I'm forgetting the denominator. Now, if the denominator you do the same trick I've done, and then you integrate, you have something to the power n. Okay? So when you also include the denominator, and you equate left-hand side and right-hand side of the equations, what you would get is the following. You get... get that omega of delta is equal to this, this here, right? You have something like, I don't know, this object here. And then you have something, the denominator, also to the power n of the sum uh, k from zero to infinity, exponential of minus d, d to the k, divided by k factorial, and then this multiple integral for l from one to k, d delta l, omega delta l, and the Dirac delta of omega, sorry, delta my, minus one divided by z, minus the sum, one to k delta l. Right. No, no, because uh, you integrate over uh, over lambdas. <coughs> over this la uh, this lambda that appears here in set, yes, it will depend. But uh, you have to still you have to still make the replica limit. Okay. So whatever you have there, when you send n going to zero, is one. Okay. Now you make the replica limit, <laughs> yeah, and this goes. This gives you bless you. This gives you one, right? And this day. Now, the cell consistent equation that you have for the omega of delta. Tell me. Is it the, is it the part of the denominator in the power of n? Yeah, so actually, if you think about the difference between numerator and denominator, is that in the denominator is equal to the numerator, but you're integrating over, uh, over the free variable, right? So, if you look at, at the derivation we did, this is equivalent of, let me delete this thing, I'm going to write it again, don't worry. So if you look at the, we did in the, in the numerator, the denominator is equal to this part here, but I have to integrate now over x, right? When I integrate over x, this gives one, and then this integral, okay, disappears, right? This disappears because it's normalized, and you have something to a given power. That when n goes to zero, it gives you one. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, because you, if you look at the Salvon equation, since p zero must be normalized the denominator is the numerator integrated. Yeah? You remember the Salpon equation? So the Salpon equation in terms of p hat, p0 of x, was equal to, right? 
So when you do this derivation, the denominator is exactly the, the same derivation, but then you integrate over x. Okay. No, but when you wrote the omega delta is 1 over x. No, no, no. It's another thing. Yeah. This denominator is the no. The denominator of the frame tour is the the the, the denominator I left in the Salvon equations because I was only analyzing the numerator. Yeah. More questions. Okay. So you have to do this derivation. It's the only, only proper way to learn it. Okay. But anyway. So suppose that you do derivation or or you believe me. The next problem is how on earth I solve numerical ideas, no? Because suppose now I want to simply do a plot of the spectral density for Poissonian graphs. So what do I have at this point? I have that within a replica symmetric ansatz. Symmetric ansatz. I have that the spectral density is equal to taking the imaginary part of the integral d delta of omega delta delta, where the omega of delta obeys this self-consistency equation. Omega of delta is equal to k from 0 to infinity exponential of minus d, d to the k, divided by k factorial integral of the product of L from 1 to K, D delta L omega delta L, and then a direct delta of delta minus 1 divided by Z minus the sum of L from 1 to K delta L. So the question is now, well, can I solve this in exactly? Mm, uh, yeah, or not. So then how, uh, how I, uh, I evaluate this thing numerically? Because the idea would be the following. So in principle, remember that Z is equal to lambda minus aita. And then I want to plot the spectral density no? for certain value of T, for certain value of the average connectivity. So fixing the value, of, suppose that I take, I take a small value of eta, OK? And I fix the value of lambda. I have to put it here, right? I have to solve this equation somehow. And when I have the solution for this omega of delta, I have to do this. Where you have to remember that omega, sorry, delta is a complex number. So let us take that. The real part of delta, let us call it A. The imaginary part of delta, let us call it B. So when I put here, like, omega of delta, it's a density of two variables, A and B. Uh, and then the spectral density is simply the integral with respect to the, uh, the second. The spectral density would be actually in this notation would be this, right? Would be the integral over d a d b omega a b b, right? which is what you were asking the other day, what was delta. So delta is a complex number, so therefore omega of delta is a density of for two variables. Tell me. You don't understand, sorry, what, what? Yeah. No, I didn't cancel it. So there were different denominators, as far as I recall. And what happened is like, it would, then you have to take the limit n going to 0. So you have something to the power n okay. in the denominator and something to the power n in the denominator. So both terms go to 0. Sorry, go to 1 when n goes to 0. Okay. So it, they are not canceled. They disappear for in the limit. Tell me. Delta of delta, sorry. So in this, in the expression of uh, density, when you take the imaginary part here, yeah. you just put D. 
Yeah. But why, why can you do this? Because this is real. So, so okay, so this is a notation. So this is a density of, a, of, a, of the two um, yes, independent variables of the complex number, okay? So the, and this, you are taking the imaginary part of delta, which is B. So I'm doing the double integral of A and B of this density with respect to B. Yeah, so A, so delta is A plus IB. So therefore, if I put this thing here, the imaginary part is, the, the imaginary part of delta is B. Ah, okay, so again, this notation, what this, in, what no, this. No, no. The integration, um, yes, the, the one that you were just telling me. Means this. Delta. Yeah. This, what is, what is notation, what it means is dA, dB, omega of AB. Okay, so this is just compare notation because otherwise, you know, the derivation would be a, a bit more annoying, which I understand that is annoying enough, but that maybe one should be more careful, okay? So this, well, the way you have to understand it, or the proper way to, read it, to write it from the beginning should have been the product of L from 1 to K of D, A, L, D, B, L, omega, A, L, B, L. And then you take here, and this Dirac delta, means you have to take the real delta for the real and the ima imaginary part of this. So you have to take this object, split it into the real and the imaginary part, and this is, you have two direct deltas. One for the relationship between real to real and the other one imaginary to imaginary. Better? What, sorry, what is your doubt? No, please. No, it's not an integral over the, com the complex plane. Ah, this is notation. Ah, That's okay, why. Sorry, okay. Yeah, it's not. It's not. A, it's not a contour integral. Ah, okay. Yeah. More questions? Okay. So let's go to the. Okay. So again. So I want to plot a spectral density of this. So you see the problem. The problem is uh, fixing a, an eta, okay, that actually in this case you, you can take the limit to zero explicitly. Generally speaking, and there is no problem. I have to fix the value of lambda. I put it here. I have to solve this in somehow, and then I have to do this integral. Then how, how, how do I do this? Well, so um, this is uh, kind of an integral equation, of which is how it, it's, it's very annoying, no? So it's very difficult to see what to do with this to solve it. Right. So the way to do it is by realizing that all the pieces that appear here can be understood in a probabilistic manner, and you can use some kind of uh, updating that keeps this uh, probabilistic interpretation of any of these pieces. And this is what is called population dynamics. So what is the idea? Let me delete this part. So the idea is to use what is called the fixed point iteration method. You know what is the fixed point iteration method, right? Fixed point iteration method is what you have a fixed point equation and you solve it by doing the fixed point iteration method. Okay, so a fixed point, fixed point equation, so let, let us remind this thing, okay? A fixed point is a point, you know, it's a point that always an equation of this sort. Yeah? What's up? I'm a little bit confused. About In what? Yes. Uh, in principle, it was trivial for... No, it, it was complex. Also, in the cavity method, it's complex. Oh, okay. 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 But then we are, at, like, we are taking... We are integrating, of course, over the imaginary. So then it is, like, the exponential of the variance and the variance is complex. Mm -hmm. But I understand that we have to integrate over all the planes. Because in the beginning, we 
R with the D delta. So it's computing now that I understand. I understand that I'm using the same notation to mean different things, and yeah. that's my that's my mistake. Okay. So this, sorry, no, let, let me clarify. This, okay, for a complex normal, no, normally it, it means contour integral, right? Okay. Maybe, maybe I should have written something like this, right? Oh, okay, yeah. But what this thing means, from the beginning. yeah. From the, yeah, because then, for example, when we try to integrate, like, uh, we have complex numbers and we change the variables, like it's not trivial how we do the Jacobian and everything. Yes, no, no, but this is just yeah, compact yeah, notation to, a, to represent this. Okay. okay. I understand. Ask. Okay. The problem is like if I take, if I put explicitly the real and the imaginary part, the derivation becomes a bit more annoying. Yes, yes. That's the, that's the only thing I, I, I do it. Okay. And also to annoy you as well. Okay. More questions? Um, yeah, it's a density. Yeah, it's something, sorry, I didn't mention, but I think I mentioned that uh, our last, last lecture. In, a, in the replica symmetric ansatz, this is a, a density in the sense of a real density, a probability distribution of the parameters that appear in the Gaussian distribution. Yeah? So it's a real function, it has two arguments. One is, you know, the real part of delta, and the other one is the imaginary part of delta, but they put it in this compact manner. So, so omega is real and has the sense of a density, okay? Because if you look at the expression of the error parameter in, in RS, the error parameter is a, is a distribution, so therefore uh, the density must be positive, definite, and it must be, you know, and it's normalized because the order parameter is normalized. If this, well, if this object was not a density, then I cannot, uh, I cannot use the trick I'm going to use. It doesn't make any sense. Very good question. Tell me. Eh? What is delta? Which delta? Dirac delta or capital delta? Capital delta is simply a complex number that appear in the RS ansatz for the other parameter. That's it, right? So remember that the RS ansatz for the other parameter, okay, I wrote it like this. Omega of delta, the product alpha from 1 to n, exponential minus x alpha squared, divided by 2 delta, divided by square root of, yeah? In reality, I should have written this, but, they, but this is annoying, no? I should write this equal to the integral over dA, dB, omega A, B, product alpha 1, n, exponential. And I want to kill myself already, okay? So this is... 2a plus i b divided by blah, 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 right? And then since this is, has to be properly normalized, I have to tell you, ah, since this is a complex number, be careful because, you know, the real part has to be all this thing I'm assuming. Okay, so it's, it's just the variance of this. Yeah, it is the variance. It is the complex variance. Tell me. Okay, I know this is totally artificial because you are not analyzing like a single system. Yeah. This is the what? Like the, the yeah, well, I mean, the replica symmetry, the, no, the, the solution to the cell point, yeah, you can say that it's the stationary measure that's so, yeah, yeah, but sure. Yeah, but we are taking this as probabilities, and it's the same problem. Yeah, but remember that I call them probabilities yeah, yeah. because I'm using, I'm, I'm abusing the vocabulary of statistical mechanics, but these are not probabilities because these are complex numbers, yeah, yeah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. This is not the other partition function. I don't care. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. Okay, I don't care why because in any part, in no part of this derivation, I have to use probability. You know, probability identities or probability certain properties of probabilities to do the derivation. No way. In the only place that is going to be important is here, and here I know that p is a is a normal is a normalized quantity, and therefore this is a density. This is the only place where the idea concepts for probabilities are important, not in the rest of the derivation. More questions? Tell me. Uh, the, um, now we are using uh, that method to solve uh, that equation there because uh, nonetheless it's still complicated. 
Well. No, yeah, yeah, that's uh, for sure. But numerically, like the goal uh, is still hard with the numerical uh, yeah. techniques. And now I'm going to show you a very cool trick. It was introduced by George. No, it was introduced by an article by a German author that I forget. I apologize. And then uh, George, I think, popularized it in, uh, in diluted spin glasses, which is called population dynamics. Okay. okay. And then for RS, it's very easy. And then if you have one step replication metric breaking, what well, this is the, the result in a population dynamics called survey propagation in certain limit for the temperature, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But I'm going to show you a very cool trick to solve this. It's very cool. And if you understand this trick, then you can do, uh, you can then apply to a study the case of, you know, the statistics of, uh, of the number of eigenvalues in a, in, a, in a given interval. More questions? Okay, so let me go back to this. Th this uh, is just a small reminder. I, I'm pretty sure that you know, okay? So a fixed point is a point x that obeys an equation like of this sort. And it's anything in life or in mathematics you, uh, you find you, you want to introduce ways to solve equations of this sort. There is something is called fixed point iteration method. Fixed point is fixed point iteration method. That, of course, is a numerical way of approximating a fixed point to a, to a given fixed point equation. Okay? So suppose. Fixed point iteration method consists in the following. Suppose I have a guess. Let me call the fixed point. I call the fixed point P. P is going to be is going to be my fixed point. Fixed point is the point that solves this equation. So suppose I, ha I, ha I have a guess for a fixed point. Let's call this thing P zero. So this is a guess. Guess for the fixed point. What's up? Sorry, uh, I know that this about P of function P initially is defined as the sum of the Dirac deltas, right? It's introduced as a, with the functional Dirac delta, uh, telling that this P, P of X, must be uh, 1 divided by N, the sum over the, yes. Yeah, yeah. But this, this, uh, this empirical spectral density, so it's, it, it, this is still a, has the, has the, no, uh, the, 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 the property of being a density, no? a distribution. Yes. Um, like thinking, as, uh, thinking of Dirac delta, as Dirac delta is not imaginary, right? No. Yeah, then I well, well, I'm not sure what you mean by imaginary. Okay, continue. I think the, I, th I think I know what you, what you want to ask, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I think that P zero should be real, not imaginary. But in here, you're writing P zero as imaginary number, so I'm a little confused. No, you you don't. So okay, so first that the, you, you say uh, when you say that the Dirac delta cannot have imaginary parts, I, I'm not sure what you are referring to. If you refer to the argument of a Dirac delta, yeah, it can have imaginary parts. If you understand, if the argument of a Dirac delta is a complex number, and you understand that the Dirac delta applies to the real and the, and the imaginary part, yeah. And for the thing you mentioned before, uh, so let me see. So the, this P of X came from what? Came first for defining this, right? Um, yeah. So here there is no issue with, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? And then what? And P0 is part of Px that makes. Ah, yeah, and then this goes to the, to the derivation, and then we go. We get a saddle point and an integral over path integral over p and p p hat, yes. yeah. And then we p and p hat they have to obey the saddle point equations. And at some point, uh, so you see one of the saddle point equations tells you that p is normalized, yeah. And you say that in which part it says that it's imaginary. Um, so 
Ja. No, but no, no. Uh, in, in P0, there is no ima imaginary part. Uh, in P0, there is no imaginary part. But in the way you uh, parameterize P0, there is, a, there is one um, parameter that can be imaginary, this, this delta, no? Okay. Sorry, so maybe it was just later on asking the question. More questions? Okay, so what is the idea of the fixed point iteration method? So you have a fixed point, you have a guess for a fixed point, P0, and then you do the following. You generate a series of P's, Pn from 0 to, I don't know, infinity, that is generated by this function. You say Pn is equal to G of Pn minus 1, no? starting from n greater or equal than 1. Yeah? So you know this method, right? And if the sequence converges, it converges to a fixed point. Why? Because, well, if you, make a, if the, if you have that the sequence converges, that means the limit of n going to infinity of Pn is something. Let's call it P, P tilde. You take the limit here and here, and then P tilde obeys that P tilde is equal to G of P tilde, so therefore P tilde must be P. So this is the fixed point iteration method. Clear? A fixed point is very cool. This method is very cool because any root finding problem can be transformed into a fixed point problem. And fixed point problems in numerical analysis are much easier to treat than a root finding problems. Anyway, sorry? This process? You start with a guess of a fixed point, whatever. I don't know, God comes and give it to you, right? And then you use the guess to generate P1. Then P1 to generate P2. And then you generate a sequence of P's. Now, if, if the limit of the sequence converges, right, this limit must be equal to a fixed point. Why? Because if I take this rule that generated the sequence, and I make the limit, the limit of n going to infinity of P n, this would be P tilde. This must be equal to the limit n going to infinity of g pn minus 1, assuming that the function is continuous, etc., etc., this is equal to g of p tilde. So p tilde is equal to g of p tilde, so therefore p tilde must be p, which is a fixed point. Good? Are you with me? Okay, so I'm going to use this stupid thing and the observation that things that appear here are uh, can be understood, different pieces can be understood as densities to solve this thing numerically. Cool? Okay, so I do the following. Let me de delete this thing. This is something that you learned in kindergarten. Okay. You see, so take that omega of delta is a density. We already discussed what it means, omega of delta. It's omega of A and B. Okay? It's a density of two variables. Okay? Now, suppose that, you know, now forget about this problem. Okay? Suppose that you have a probability distribution and you have a machine that produces random numbers according to that distribution. Yeah? And then you have a collection of random numbers according to the distribution. Let's say that this collection is this one. I have a collection of random numbers, L from 1 to N, that were generated according to this density, right? In the sense that if I have a collection of random numbers that are, were generated with, dense, this, with, with this density, it is clear that I can construct a histogram, okay, or an estimator for the density that would be what? It would be simply 1 over my collection of variables of the sum of a l from 1 to n of a direct delta of delta minus delta lambda. This, this delta has nothing to do with other deltas. This is something separate. Okay? So I have a density 
whatever, and then there is a machine that produces random numbers according to, the, to this density. So therefore, I can construct the histogram or an estimator for this density in the, in, the, in the sense that if I take n going to infinity here, I should recover back to, to this density. Yeah? So let's put this estimator in such a way that the limit of n goes to infinity of omega accent sub n of delta, this would be omega of delta. Yeah, good. So far so good. I have not said anything uh, uh, complicated yet. Now, the idea is the following now. How I'm going to use, how I'm going to solve this, uh, this uh, self-consistency equation for the omegas. What I'm going to do is, instead of taking this density and parameterize it with parameters and, may, and maybe close these equations for those parameters, I'm going to represent this density with a population of random variables in such a way that if, we, if I were to do, you know, the histogram, I would recover that density, okay? So eventually it would be, I don't know, I could, I don't know, maybe do a Fourier transform and, you know, uh, try to close those equations for an infinite number of parameters. But what I do is, I first, I represent, this would be zero, I would represent uh, omega of delta with a collection of, of variables that if I were to construct the histogram, I would recover this. Okay, very well, and in, 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 and in the limit of the population going to infinity, precisely, you would get that density. Yes? Now, when I look at this equation, what do I see? What do I see is that if I take from this expression one, el one element of the population that represents this density, this equation is telling you, okay, this population of random variables that represent this density must be updated according to the following. Draw first a random number according to a Poissonian distribution with mean value of D. Let us say that this random number is K, right? Go to my population that represents the density and pick K numbers completely randomly, right? Calculate this object take another number of the population randomly and update this value according to this. Okay, so what I do is the following. So first I represent the density with a population of random variables. Now, I start with some kind of initial, I don't know, I, ca I can generate this sequence randomly, okay? And then what I do is the following. Now I generate, generate a Poisson number uh, was some random number. Suppose that it's k to follow this, uh, this notation, say k, uh, and the Poisson random number has mean value d, okay, because this is the parameter of the Poisson distribution with mean value, value d. Now, these integrals, since I'm integrated over densities, and the densities are represented by a collection of random variables, okay, integrating over these densities is equivalent of taking one element with the same probability, one over n, or in each of the integrals. That means to take one k elements randomly from the population. So the next step two would be pick up uh, k, elements from this population, from the population, randomly, uh, that would be uniformly randomly, uniformly randomly. Okay, suppose that these elements are the following, right? So they are called, I don't know, is a delta L1 up to delta LK, right? 
Then, okay, pick another one. Pick an extra one, extra element. Let us call it delta prime, or let us call it, I don't know, delta, I don't know, L tilde. And do the following, do this following substitution. And number four, do the following replacement. Delta L prime must be substituted by one divided by Z minus the sum um, uh, I from one to K of delta L I. Okay? And then you repeat. And then you go to step one. And you repeat this process many times until you go to each element of the population and you update it according to this, what is called a probabilistic rule. And yet, at the end of the day, this population will have a profile, which is this profile, this density, that would be the solution to this equation, the numerical solution of this equation. Okay? So this is called population dynamics algorithm. Step four, yes. you see, this is telling you that this element, so this delta, yes. that would be one element of this density, or th this delta, which is a value of is the argument of this density, that according to this representation would be an element of this population, must be updated by the value given on the right hand side. Okay, okay. So I'm, uh, I am updating my orig original guess of delta L according to the distribution. Yeah. Yes. So this is the also famous population dynamics algorithm. Population. And you can do this thing and it converges very fast actually. Tell me. Yeah. Right. Which are the ones that we use in this sum? Um, yes. We use them there. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then uh, I don't get what's happening here. Yeah. And what happens is the following, right? So the reason, so first you draw a Poisson number according to that has mean value of D. Yes. Let's say this value is K. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this, this part is going to select one of the possible weights that will appear in this, in this integral. Because you have an here you have an in infinite sum of integrals. Each integral has a weight to appear. And this weight is a Poissonian weight. Yes. So what happening is like, OK, so from here, this infinite number of integrals, and then and the, the number of integrations in each integral is growing, you know, will have a weight according to a Poisson distribution. So first, I draw a number according to a Poisson distribution. Let's say that is k, right? So at the beginning, we have a guess for omega 0. Yes. Right, which is the one we have in the integral in the brackets. Yeah, because I'm, use, I'm using fixed point iteration. I understand in this, or I'm solving this as a, using fixed point iteration method, and the fact that this, each of these pieces in this equation has the meaning of density, and I'm understanding the integrals in a, in a sense of, of, a Monte Carlo in, uh, of a Monte Carlo integral. Yeah, that's okay. Before we had like x that was equal to a function of x, and we had to find the fixed point x star. Sure. In this case, we have omega of, of uh, delta, which is equal to a function of omega of delta. Le, let me, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me put this thing. Yeah, let me put this thing in the sense of a fixed point, a fixed point problem, right? So this is a fixed point equation. It's a it's a it's a unusual fixed point equation because it's given an, in an integral way. But now I, I want to solve I want to solve it 
iteratively by using fixed point iteration method. So I start with, a, with some guess of the density. This guess is omega zero delta. I put it here, and then I get omega one delta. Then omega one delta, I put it here, omega two delta, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the first, the first thing you have to do is to understand, to, to realize, or to give up your hope of solving this in any other possible way, but using fixed point iteration method because you don't know anything else, right? So first I put this thing as a fixed point iteration method, but again it's weird because it's an integral equation. You know? The second step is to say, ah, I could, I could, since these are densities, I could parameterize them with a certain number of parameters. For instance, you could say, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a Gaussian approximation. You could do that. And then you write down equations for the Gaussian parameters that will, 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 uh, will result from this equation. Yeah? Or you can say, instead of approximating this density by some functional form, like say Gaussian or whatever, what I'm going to do is to approximate the density by a population of random numbers in such a way that if I were to do the histogram, this would represent the density. Yeah? So then you start at time zero, well, at step zero in your algorithm, which is the initial condition, which you start with some initial values, let us put it that way, some initial values for this collection of random variables that would represent your initial case for the density at t equals zero. Right? And then what this guy, the, the left, sorry, the right hand side, what is telling you is the following. Because here, again, you have an infinite number of, in, of sum of integrals. You know, this is a probabilistic weight. It's telling you that from all possible infinite number of integrals that here appear, you know, they, they, they are coupled to a Poissonian weight, and then the result of this integral is conditioned to that value of the Poissonian weight. So first you draw a random number according to a Poisson distribution, and this will allow you then to estimate the integral coupled to that weight of the Poissonian distribution. So I think you said I retake this Poissonian number. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah? At step one, I generate a Poisson random number with parameter d, and let's say this is k. Let's say first time is two, then it's seven, then it's six, five, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Fix k. I go here, and I interpret this thing as a, as a Monte Carlo integral, right? Where what I'm doing is parameterizing this, these densities with, uh, with their population, right? So the way, the way to understand now how this uh, is used to uh, integrate the integral, which is a direct delta, is to say, well, since you know this density is given in terms of a population, the probability that one element of the density appears is, is taking one of the elements uniformly randomly from the population with probability one over n. Okay, so you have to take them uniformly randomly. How many of them? Well, since this condition now, for a given value of the Poisson number, you have to take k. Yeah? Once you have taken k uniformly randomly, you calculate this object. Yeah. You calculate one divided by set, okay, for this k deltas that you uh, got from the population. And then what is left is to, is, to, is, to, is to decide what to do with this number, this, this number here. So for this, you realize that this number is equal to delta, inside a direct de delta, and this delta is the argument of the density on the other side. But the density is parameterized or is represented by its population. So the probability that one value appears in the population is 1 over n. Because the po population is represented by, by a collection of random numbers and the probability of appearing is 1 over n. So you take one, uh, you take one element in the population uniformly and randomly and you substitute that element, that would be step 3, by the value you have calculated. And then you repeat, and then you repeat, and then you repeat. You go from t, from 0 to 1, 3, 4, etc., etc. And at the end of the day, okay, in principle, this will converge to a population whose profile is a solution to the, the self-consistency equation. So this is when the nota value is a distribution. Huh? 
No, it's a distribution. Okay, but I mean, but again, so the idea of a fixed point, when, you, when we learn it, you learn it for, for a real number, but it's any kind of mathematical object that obeys an equation of that sort. And of course, you can apply it here. Yeah? So algebra is totally randomly from 1 to n. Yeah. And Uniformly round, randomly. And then you substitute that value for the value you calculated with the other elements you choose from the population. N what? N has to be two or three times big. No? Uh, well, N, now you have to, no, with this thing you have to be a bit careful, but okay. N must be big enough so that it would be represent well a density. Yeah? And if happens that, uh, that the population that you have is, small, is smaller than the value of D, uh, maybe, maybe you, you take with replacement or something like this. You have to be a bit careful with this. But normally for the numerics you do, for an average connectivity, or let's say 5, 7, 10, uh, normally you take a population of 1,000, 10,000, and this is more than enough. So you're not going to have that problem. Yeah. More questions? The, the index uh, uh, I on L is just to keep track, uh, just to be sure. Yeah, it's uh, just to keep track of the... The, the ones I chose, okay? Yeah, yeah. So I chose, you know, for this one I chose K randomly, and this could be, you know, L1 and L2 and LK. Yeah. Yeah. Samples, uh, delta, and then we take uh, a subset of this. Uh, so, like there are. Yeah, and this would be a subset. I couldn't put. I, I cannot. I couldn't put here, delta one, delta k, because you could uh, un misunderstand that this would be the first element of the population. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm taking k elements of right. the population randomly. The first one is uh, L1. L1 goes from one yeah, to yeah. n, up to LK that goes from one to n. Thanks. Tell me. Uh, is you can use the same criteria that you use in the fixed point iteration method, which are called stopping criteria. You can use any of them. Applied now not to a real number, but to a, to a density. For instance, what you could do is to take, I don't know, the expectation value, the expectation value of this, of some object that is related to this one, and see how the expectation value changes when you are, you are using this algorithm. And as soon as it reaches a stationary point, you are happy. Yeah? Any kind of stopping criteria. Well, you have to adapt the stopping criteria for, from real numbers to densities, but the idea is the same. That is what, sorry? This integral is a contraction. Ah, in the sense of fixed point, that uh, the, the, this thing must be a contraction, otherwise, otherwise there, there would not be a fixed point. Uh, sure. But th th this is, a, that, that, that stays in the part that when I assume that the limit, well, no, no, it's not only the limit, it's that, it's that the limit exists and you have to have certain properties of the, the mapping no, around the fixed point. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, I'm not, I don't know how to prove mathematically whether, whether this map is a contraction or not. Just for the cases I've seen, it always converges. So what happens in, in, in spin glasses in replica symmetry is that it doesn't converge, but it's, it, it is understood why also. Yeah, yeah, this, this is the annoying part. Yeah, you fix a value of lambda. So you fix a value of lambda, then you solve this thing by population dynamics, then you get the spectral density for that, that value of lambda, then you have a point in the spectral density, and you have to repeat again. Yeah. More questions? Have you seen before this kind of uh, population dynamics algorithm? I guess you, you, you have not seen it. Ah, oh, fuck, this is... <laughs> Sorry, YouTube. <laughs> okay, can I can I lead you on an exercise? Well, because many of you have studied of the, you have 
Yeah, I've gone to lectures with spin glasses. So at some point, maybe you, you, you should have seen, you know, diluted spin glasses as, for instance, the Vianna Brain model, or even the, the, the ferromagnet on, uh, on Poissonian graphs, okay? So if you go to the first example I used to do the replica method, which was, a, was the IC model on uh, erdos Renyi graphs, you can do the same thingy. I've done here, do there also the RS ansatz. And what you, you obtain is the following. You obtain a, you, you have also a density. In this case, it's a density of cavity fields. And the density has to obey the following equation, no? Uh, k from zero to infinity, exponential of minus d, d to the k divided by k factorial. The integral for L from one to k, dHL omega HL. And then you have the Dirac delta of H minus the sum L from 1 to K of U of H L J. Where, where yes, this function U is the function U that appeared in the cavity equations for the, that case. That was uh, the propagating field or message. Right? So this would be the resulting for the easy model on Poissonian graphs. And now the magnetization of this model would be given in terms of the following, would be given by the integral dh hyperbolic tangent of beta h uh, omega of h. So you see, so what happens, remember what is this u, okay? This u of x, y, it was one over beta, the arc hyperbolic tangent of the hyperbolic tangent of beta x times the hyperbolic tangent of beta y. Yeah? So I'll leave you this thing as an exercise. It's a, it's a very cool numerics to do. Use population dynamics in this case. Now these are real numbers. It's, it's not a density of two variables. You apply the same trick, and then you get a solution, numerical solution for this, for a given value of beta. You plug it into here. And then you can plot the magnetization, you know, magnetization as a function of t. And you should obtain a critical value, tc, that actually you can derive exactly its value using bifurcation analysis, but that's a different story. Yeah. And if you are into Monte Carlo simulations and things like that, compare the result of the magnetization you obtain here with Monte Carlo simulations. Clear? Questions? Tell me. Uh, okay, after getting the omega delta, uh -huh. we want to put that into the density, yeah. spectral density. Yes. That's tomorrow or we are done? Ah, no, no, I can continue doing uh, the, that. Okay, this would finish this part of the spectral density, but. Uh, we can continue with the lectures. Uh, we, no, we can no, discuss no, more no, mappings no, and things no, like no, that. I don't know. My question is, my question is then, how it looks with spectral density for this? How do you what, sorry? How it looks. How, how does it look? Uh, that's interesting. That depends on, on the connectivity of the graph. And normally, the connectivity has two, two parts, one continuous part and one discrete part. Um, and that's actually very interesting. And at the beginning, it was, maybe it was not understood, but it's very trivial, right? So depending on the value of d, okay, when d goes to infinity, when the average connectivity goes to infinity, but you have to be careful of how to rescale something in the, okay, in the system. When d goes to infinity, you, you obtain a spectral density that looks like this. It's a semicircle. It's, this is called the Wigner semicircular law, right? This would be for d going to infinity. And even, even you can make the limit properly uh, uh, mathematically, and you should obtain this law. But you have to rescale something so that this limit uh, you know, is done in a non-trivial manner. So you will obtain the Wigner semicircular law. For values smaller than infinity, or for small values of d, let's say d equal to three, four, five small values. 
what you obtain, and actually you can do this thing, right? So what you can do is you, you can generate Poissonian graphs numerically, yeah? And you can uh, diagonalize them, and you can construct the histogram. You would obtain a continuous part, something like this, whatever. Well, it has to be symmetric, and you can prove that it has to be symmetric. But inside the continuous part, you have Dirac deltas. Also symmetric. And these Dirac deltas, they have a weight. And the weight is related with the topology of the, of the network and how connected or disconnected you have different components of the network, right? Like for instance, you know, you have a Dirac delta at zero with a given weight, and this weight can be related with certain, with having a graph uh, that can be, you know, dis uh, decomposed into two giant components connected to each other, and also can be related to the fact that you may have isolated nodes. Why? Because if you have isolated nodes, what is going to happen? Suppose that D is small. Remember that the D is the average connectivity, yeah? So it might happen that when you draw a Poissonian graph randomly, it might happen that a node is not connected, yeah? Do, do you agree with me? So suppose that, and this would happen with more plurality when D is smaller and smaller. So suppose that, you know, you have a poor node here, and then you have the rest of the graph. I'm going to put it here. So this part is connected, and this node is uh, along by, and by itself. Yeah? So that means that in the, in the, let's say that this node is not number one, right? This is node one, and this is the rest of the nodes, so rest. So that means that in the connectivity matrix, so this row is all zeros, yeah? Because poor node number one is not connected to with anything else. That means if I were to uh, construct, to calculate the eigenvalues of this, I have to do one minus lambda, the identity matrix, yeah? So then a lambda will appear here, and then here lambdas for the rest of the graph. So that means that there is an eigenvalue which is zero. Yeah? So the weight here is not the only contribution. One part of the weight of this Dirac delta is due to isolated nodes. Good? Now, you might have situations like following. Now I don't remember the, the, the whole zoology of this, okay? Suppose you have now, so let me see, you have a graph and then instead of having one node isolated, you have a couple of nodes connected but isolated with the rest. So that means you can diagonalize these two pieces apart. And this will give a particular contribution, okay? I don't think to the zero, but I think, you know, to other eigenvalues. And you may have then the starts, okay? Okay, this connected to the rest of the graph, and this gives an extra contribution, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So any small part of the network which is not connected to a giant component will contribute to the different ways of the Dirac delta. And in some cases, some of these conditions are, you can uh, calculate them ex exactly. Yeah? More questions? How did you call this the Yayan component? The component. La componente gigante, Yayan. Yeah. Sorry for my broken English. More questions? I have a question on the exercise that uh, you, well, you get the, to obtain the same thing for the, for the, in, for the IP model on the Poissonian uh, graph. Yeah. We had obtained uh, an equation, a self-consistent equation for the H, but uh, I don't remember or I didn't write uh, there was no exponential term. It was uh, like h uh, of something, like the, the h i is equal to itself. That's a, that's com that comes from the cavity equations. Yeah. Ah, okay. Not from, from the, the replica method. From the, the replica method. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think the replica. So I use uh, again the easy model 
for a ferromagnet on a Poissonian graphs. As an example of the replica method, we did a step one, but we didn't do a step two. But now you know how to do the step two. So I think it's better that you do it in that case. Right. More questions? Okay, before, before we go, give me just one second, okay? And then you decide if you want to have more lectures because now I can talk about other mappings, yeah? So then remember that in this case, when you take the replica limit, the replica is, is n going to zero, and there are some factors that disappear, okay? In some other mappings of in random matrices, there are other objects which are much more interesting that require to take the replica limit going to an imaginary number or real number, depending on how you do the mapping. This in the cell consistency equation for the omega of delta will appear as something like this, okay? So you have omega of delta would be proportional, then you have the Poisson distribution, that would be, that this always appears for Poissonian graphs, of, of course. And then you have this multiple integral for L from one to K. Then you have a Dirac delta that tells you that this delta here and this delta are connected somehow. And now here, if you don't take the replica limit going to zero, to something else, you have here something like this, an exponential of a function that depends on these deltas. Which is annoying because this, this is not, doesn't have now in principle a probabilistic interpretation, or maybe yes. If you manage to understand that this can be, that this can be understood in a, some, somehow as a, as a weight, then you can generalize population dynamics to something that's called weighted population dynamics, and then you're gonna solve much more, much more cooler problems in random matrix theory. So I'll let you th to think how you would, if you would have something like this, how you generalize population dynamics to account for this extra term. That's it. Questions? Coffee? Let's go.